So this is a kind of unique week in that the readings that we have in our 10-week version of the course line up exactly the same as the readings that Dr. Clavel Hall had in her 15-week version of the course. So one of the things that we have this week is just a single lecture. The other thing that's a little bit unique about this week is that between the information that Dr. Clavel Hall gave at the beginning as well as the discussion that she had at the end wasn't quite as long as some of the other weeks. So what you find here is a more complete lecture than we've seen in most of the other weeks. So there's only a couple of slides at the end that I'll come back in and talk to you about. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Clavel Hall. So we're starting today with the, doing a bit about measurement and evaluation. And as we go toward looking at this lesson, I want you to start to think about uh, your EBP projects that you might, the projects that you, uh, the projects that you may be working on, the topic that you think might be of interest to you, because a lot of tonight's uh, lecture and, and discussion is about information that's going to be valuable to you when you are beginning to do your project. So this is about the real future world of your project, things that you're going to be looking at. And uh, how did you find the overall reading for this week? Was it straightforward, kind of challenging, stretching you a little bit? Any comments on the general reading from the two texts that we had for tonight? So it's beginning to try and make a little big picture sense, even if it's at the 30,000 foot view for you. Right. <laughs> and what I have to say about that is as you move towards your project, which is why I'm mentioning your project, uh, you will have a greater appreciation for how this all fits together. So I just ask you to hang in there. It will become a part of your world more than you would like in time. Okay, so hang in there. So today we're going to look at some things like making sense of evaluation, a little bit of data management, and looking at some designs and discussing some problems that we have with measuring and looking at some evaluation uh, approaches. So as we uh, do that, we had some of the reading where they talked about things like um, internal validity. And do you have any uh, idea of uh, what they were speaking about when they talked about internal validity and this uh, generalizability and the transportability? Uh, I think you've touched on some issues, but I think we have to back up a little bit, look at some of the fundamentals before we go forward with the biases, okay, and the incentives. And I'm going to ask you to pull out your White and uh, Dudley Brown book. I think this is uh, probably Kyle's favorite book. And we're going to page 324, please. And as we get to page 324, we're looking at the one paragraph that says internal validity and generalizability. And I'm going to, I need to ask someone uh, to please read that one paragraph for us so that we can get a handle on these terms. So mm -hmm. did we get that sentence? Internal validity is uh, trying to make sure that some confounder, meaning some outside impact or resource or out, outside uh, element is causing the change, something other than the intervention. So internal validity is trying to minimize any impact from confounders or outside forces. Are we okay with that? Okay. So we'll stop there. Generalizability, as she said, is this is the uh, expectation that you'll apply that same intervention to another setting or to a different population, generalizability. 
taking your intervention of hand washing that you started in the intensive care unit and then seeing how it works in the med surge unit. Okay, a different setting, a different population. So that's generalizability. Uh, and if you go down two more sentences, it says generalizability is not expected. And that means in translational research, generalizability is not expected. In other types of research, they do ask the question, can I apply this intervention to another setting or to a different population? So they say here, White says it's not expected, but Stella is going to show us what is expected. That last uh, sentence, the last part of the, okay, thank you. So I'm gonna ask someone else, what do you think is the difference looking at this paragraph between generalizability and transportability? To Stella's question, I think Amadeep is correct. Yes, we do want to spread it to other areas. We're not doing work in translation research and other types of research just to contain it in small microsystem areas or even one larger area. We want to expand it, but Amandeep is correct in that we still need to do another uh, microsystem assessment at that new location so that we can ensure that for what? She says the culture, the fit, the feasibility, the resources, all the things we've been talking about, every time you change the setting or population, you need to relook at those things. So uh, Stella, we do want to expand things and uh, we just need to reassess every time we start uh, to move it to another place. Why would you think that's important to do that? And so, uh, I, I agree, you're correct on that. And I'm gonna go back to my earlier question. Uh, what is the difference between generalizability and transportability? I'm gonna send you back to that paragraph that Stella read for us and look at the definition of generalizability and look at the definition on the screen of transportability and tell me what is the difference. Exactly, does everybody see that? It is not, and as uh, back to Stella's question, why would we say generalizability is not expected? It's not expected because interventions are expected to be uh, implemented in different settings with different populations. We are trying to get beyond the same settings and the same population. When you scale up, you're going to different areas. When you expand, you're going to meet with differences. And we still want to be able to try and either uh, adopt or adapt according to what needs to be done based upon what Amandeep has told us after we've done our reassessment and try and apply the new evidence-based intervention. Do we get that? Any questions on that? So there is a difference. So then we look at uh, evaluation is something that we're looking a lot at for this week. And uh, we, I would first ask you, why do you think we need to spend time on translational evaluation from your readings? Why do you think we're even bothering to take time to do this? And, and these people, they may conduct research, but they're not conducting it just to hold it to their chest for their own and only own, their own benefit. They may be trying to hold the money that they make from that research for themselves, but research usually goes out to other people, especially healthcare research. That's usually the underlying reason for it to improve healthcare outcomes. So you're doing it to improve healthcare outcomes. So you've got to send it out to people who are going right. to be benefiting from that. And that's one reason where, why you will seldom find people doing research just for their own private or personal benefits. Stephen Hawkins is a wonderful 
example, yes, he conducted research that benefited him, but it didn't die and go away when he died last year. It was to benefit other people with like problems that needed like solutions, okay? So uh, as, uh, as Lindsay said, uh, that uh, people are not uh, performing research just for their own benefit or, or otherwise it would be for not. So we do it to benefit other people that have health problems is why we're doing it in healthcare usually, usually. And the evaluation phase of it helps us to understand when it has reached a point where it's good enough to start using or treating other people with that particular intervention. That is why we have to evaluate. If you just created a new medication and you didn't evaluate the testing of it, who's going to volunteer to use it without it uh, having been tested? Evaluation is a part of research, an integral part of research. And what's interesting for you is Evaluation is an integral part of research, but it's also an, an integral part of translational research, meaning you evaluate whether the intervention is effective, but we're looking at evaluating whether the translation of the intervention is beneficial. So you see where that's two different things we're looking at? Our class is translational research. We're looking at evaluating how we translate research. And what's noted here is evaluation begins at the planning phase. Tell me what you understand about that from your reading this week. So you're looking at the translation of that intervention uh, into practice. How did it work with yes. this new group of people? How did that set yes. up? Uh, I think it was Lindsay said, brought up uh, clinical practice guidelines as uh, one piece of uh, evidence that we often con uh, translate into practice. And so if we look at evidence-based guidelines, say for CAUDIs, when we decide we're going to go to, uh, to Tiffany's organization and try and see if this set of guidelines will work there, we need to be thinking about how we're going to evaluate this intervention even at the point of planning, even at the point of planning, okay? You begin with the end in mind. And why would you want to do that? Am I doing that just to make it a bigger and heavier and more confounding problem? Why would you want to think of the, the at the planning stage, why would you want to be uh, anticipating what the evaluation might look like? Okay, and I'm saying, I'm saying this very lighthearted, Kyle, not, uh, okay, Miss Smarty Pants. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is because you are very correct and uh, you bring out an, a very important point. Uh, as someone spoke about, I think it was uh, Jenny talked about our T1, T4 uh, translating to practice. I want to ask if we're looking at T0 or T1 to T4, which end would Kyle's efficacy uh, concept be on the continuum? T4, okay. Thank you. T4, that is where efficacy work occurs in T4. And what is the population usually? an example of a population that you would be working with at T4, the, looking at the efficacy of that intervention. General population, uh, communities, individuals in hospitals. So we're working with human beings there, okay? Let's go back. I think it's Jenny who talked about T1 and I'll say T0. If we have efficacy at T4, what concept do we have at T1 or T0, and, uh, that's the population, animals, um, animals like, mouse, like mice or rabbits, okay? So T4, mice, rabbits, 
What concept starts with an E? We have efficacy at T4. What do we have at T0, T1? It's in your book. So let's go to, can you hear me? We're going to Brownson, page seven. Everybody with me? And there's a figure 1.2. And do you see what we just talked about? And say they don't have T4 on here, but they have T3. So you see where this is practice? That is efficacy. You said we have people here. You see where the clinical practice guidelines are here? So my question is when you're at bench over here, T0, T1, where somebody said the animals are, that's where the rabbits and the, and the mice are, which concept is there? If efficacy is at the right end of the continuum, what concept is at the left? Effectiveness studies. Okay. Effectiveness studies is or what goes on at T0 and T1, okay? And that's going to be important based on the paragraph that, uh, that we just read, what was it, about uh, internal validity. On uh, page 324, this is all good. It's, it's tying together and we're trying to show you the big picture here. And you see on page 324, I'm now in white, Dudley Brown and Tahar, where we just read. And do you see, she read that internal validity refers to the extent that the uh, study avoids the confounders. This internal validity is what occurs at bench side, at bench research area. That's where you have the highest internal validity. And do you see why that would be? Why would you have the highest internal validity based on what we read on page 324 at the bench research? Why is internal validity high there. Exactly right. Does everybody see what Tiffany's telling us? She's saying internal control and internal validity is high at research because uh, confounders and circumstances are tightly controlled. Imagine you are in a Silicon Valley chip factory where they're doing research and everything is sterile, clean. You have to put on special gear to go in. Everything is tightly controlled. That's bench research. That is what uh, Tiffany's mentioning. Things are tightly controlled. So the internal validity is gonna be high where you don't have a lot of outside influences, okay? And that's what's going on on page seven with this bench research. So now tell me what's going on at the other end where we have T3, T4, what would be higher? What kind of validity would be probably most applicable at the other end? <laughs> Not internal validity, internal validity, yeah. yes. And going back to Tiffany's description, there are things that are less controlled. We are working with people now at T3 and T4 with clinical practice guidelines. We're working with people. We're working with the population. We're working with the community. How well can you control if Mr. Johnson is gonna take his high blood pressure medicine three times a day at the appointed time? How much control do you have over that as his nurse practitioner? No control. Okay. So you see how you're talking opposite of Tiffany? We've got very little, no control, 
more well, external factors. So all of, all of that that you just listed, that those are the confounders that interfere with research and cause uh, issues because humans come with issues <laughs> that cannot be controlled like you can control the atmosphere of a laboratory and a white mouse. Okay, so in the bench research, we have the effectiveness research to see if the intervention is, uh, is uh, e effective. And in the real world research, you have the efficacy research, okay? So that is where you are on the two ends of the continuum. Have I blown your head out of the water with that conversation? <laughs> Let us move on. <laughs> we will move on from that. I just want you to have a reference to where those terms uh, are affiliated with. So the next thing we're looking at is uh, outcomes. And when we look at outcomes on interventions, uh, do you work with outcomes in your current practice, your current nursing practice? What kind of outcomes do you look at? And then you also look at things like uh, the processes we will look at as well. If you turn with me to in your white and uh, Dudley Brown book to page 327, please. And we're looking at a few nursing outcomes. And the reason why I'm asking you to pay attention to these outcomes, make a note, because when you conduct your evidence-based practice projects, you will have to have an outcome. Do you rem remember the PICO question? What does the O stand for? Okay, yes. So that's a part of your PICO outcomes. So this page, this list on page 327 of, uh, of White et al. is a list of some of the things that you might consider me measuring or using as outcomes. And the reason you want to have, uh, the big thing about outcomes is they have to be measurable, okay? If you cannot measure your outcomes, how are you going to evaluate your intervention? And so uh, you have to put your, uh, your outcome in a way that it can be measurable. So what she's talking about is your outcomes, two things. Your outcomes, when you make them, you want to ask yourself, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm going to uh, measure the the uh, I'm going to measure smoking cessation. When you make the outcome, it needs uh, if it you need to ask yourself: Is it specific? What's the second question you ask yourself about that? Is it measurable? And the next one is: Is it what? Is it achievable? And third one: Is it realistic? Is it real? Or are you delusion? <laughs> Because whatever you're doing, you're going to have to complete on this project. So delusions do happen over the course of this process because you think you can do almost anything. And lastly, is it timely? And for you, when we talk about timely and your project, I say graduation. You don't want to be here forever. So those are things uh, you use the SMART goal framework for that. You will also use the same SMART uh, framework for when you determine your goals or your specific aims for your project. You want to ask yourself uh, that question about the SMART goals, as, about the uh, SMART framework as well. What it does is help you to narrow down what somebody said might be a delusional project to one that's a doable project that you can finish. Okay, so yes, out, you can apply the SMART framework to the outcomes. Okay, so we look at that. And then we look at also values and we talk about whose perspective are we, uh, are we looking at. And with 
uh, looking at whose perspective that you need to consider, I would say to you, uh, what would you think when I ask, whose, pers whose perspective do you need to consider for your uh, project? Okay. Okay, so that was my 30,000 foot uh, view of who they are. So come down. Yes, the stakeholders. Who are some of the stakeholders? Okay, the, the leadership team. Who else is a stakeholder? Okay, so that could be these people or these people. Uh, community could be these people. Okay, but I want to make sure you're thinking about these other people. Why would that be an important stakeholder? Yeah, and think about this. Uh, Tiffany wants to throw a big party. <clears throat> and whose house is it going to happen at? In, in healthcare, it, your, implement, your interventions are usually conducted at an, a healthcare organization, whether it be outpatient, inpatient, uh, a clinic, but usually you have to take it to a healthcare site. Sometimes things occur at patients' homes, but usually interventions start at a site, okay? So yes, you need to make sure because of some of the things that Stella just pointed out that you have all that buy-in. And what about this group, the insurers? Why do we need to be concerned about their perspective? Reimbursement and financing, anything else? <laughs> yes, yes, you know, because uh, we need to make sure that the intervention that we are covering is within our legal coverage and our insurance coverage uh, so that if something happens, we do have some protection, okay? And when we talk about interventions, why would we might be concerned about big pharma? And you understand what I'm saying when I say big pharma? And let me add to that, if I look at big pharma here, and she's talking about the big, the, uh, the weighty influence they have on the providers, let us not forget the weighty influence they have on policymakers. So who, who, who is the liaison? You understand what I mean when I say the word liaison? Who is what entity or body is the liaison between big pharma and policymakers? How does big pharma get to the policymaker? Insurance companies, one other way, somebody else? Yes, exactly. Yes. Does everybody understand what we mean when we talk about lobbyists? Okay, mm -hmm. lots of that influence in those uh, elements that Kyle pointed out uh, between big pharma and providers add probably 10 times the amount of influence that you probably don't know about going to some of our policymakers. So when we talk about from whose perspective do you need to consider your intervention, your project, whatever it may be, you need to think about at least these entities that are involved, as, uh, as Tiffany says, at least these stakeholders, all of these groups are stakeholders. Questions? So then we can uh, go back a little bit and talk about, talk about, uh, we're talking about evaluation. We want to make sure that we understand that there are phases and steps to the evaluation phase that we're looking at. And notice that even the evaluation phase starts with planning. And some of these phases are occurring even in earlier stages of the implementation. So you want to make sure that you've considered all of this. And when you write your papers and think about your project, these are some of the things that you want to consider slash discuss uh, to give you more robustness to your uh, discussion looking at the phases. And these are particular factors that you want to consider when you're looking at uh, outcomes. And when we look at these factors, let us go to white and brown. There's uh, page 325, there should be a table on page 325, looking at some of the factors that we will look at. 
when we're looking at outcomes, are you with me there? When you're looking at some of the factors that influence the outcomes, these are questions that you need to ask yourself when you're thinking about your project and think even when you're reading other articles, questions that you need to ask when you're looking at the outcomes, uh, what, are the, what is the level that the study is uh, looking at? You want to ask yourself, uh, let's say for instance, somebody give me a topic that you may consider doing for your project. So as you look at that, you would want to ask yourself as you're in your early thought process, which level do I want to look at that for my project? Uh, will it be the structural level? Will it be the organizational level? If you turn the page, is it the patient level? Is it the provider level? These are all different levels. And then they give you examples of things that you might want to think about. If your project is looking at the political climate or looking at the social climate or looking at some of the policies around uh, the psychiatric health, you would decide possibly that's at the, the structural setting or is it at the provider level? Are you looking at the attitudes, um, the attitudes in job satisfaction of things? Would you be looking at that? Is it at the provider level? These are questions you need to ask and they're things that help you to narrow down what you're doing before you run out and get a bunch of articles and you're trying to understand where they're going in 12 different directions. Mm -hmm. These are things that you want to ask yourself beforehand. So when your advisor discusses your project with you, you have a more focused viewpoint of where you want to go with your project. So that's something that you're looking at in that respect. Let's see. So one of the other things we want to look at is, um, design measures. Uh, so designs um, for measuring the outcomes. If I ask you, uh, what, do you what do you think of when, you, when I say uh, study design? And I'm going to ask each one of you, just tell me the first thing that you think of when I say study design. So I'm going to stop there because you guys have got that. Whenever we talk about or you talk about Study design, a part of your conversation should be whether it was qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods. There's a lot more to talk about, but that's fundamental what you want to talk about. That's your starting point, okay? So uh, study design, you want to talk about that first. Some, some of the uh, qualitative, des qualitative uh, designs we did not go into detail in this reading, but uh, you have things, anybody can name some of the qual common qualitative designs that you've come across. How about ethnography? Ever heard of that before? I know Kyle has. Uh, okay. And phenomenology, historical. Okay, so there's about four or five types of qualitative types of designs. But these are, what I have listed here, are ways that you approach qualitative designs. Uh, I think somebody um, mentioned, so I have, um, we were talking about just this area of, of uh, analysis. These are qualitative designs, those uh, three things that I talked about, things like ethnography and phenomenology and historical type designs, those are qualitative designs, and these, Approaches are how you go about conducting them. Uh, observations, that goes with ethnography, when, uh, when a researcher will go to a place and just observe and report on what he or she has observed without interacting with the participants. Uh, doing interviews, uh, where they're doing a study and they conduct interviews, or they conduct a focus group. That those are qualitative designs. When you read studies that talk about having these things, that is in the methodology, that's how they collected their information. Those are qualitative type studies. Anybody know what artifacts are when it comes to research? Artifacts are things 
that help collect, corroborate the, uh, the information that you're collecting. Artifacts are things like electronic health records results. Artifacts are things like photos. Artifacts are things like archeological findings. They are the things that help tell the story, okay? Uh, notebooks where you've kept notes, things that are gonna help you put the picture of the story together. Those are what artifacts are. And then uh, somebody mentioned doing, uh, what is it, descriptive? Uh, these descriptive and the uh, pre and post measurements, these are types of quantitative designs, okay? And so, what you have here is, I'm just showing you this, and this is the big picture. We have the research, and what we've just talked about were those four approaches that go with qualitative research. And you see across from there, you have the quantitative research. And so what I was saying is the reason I was talking about those types of research, this is the big picture of research. And I want you to think about articles you're gonna be reading and you need to know where they, uh, where they fall here. So here, these were the ethnography and phenomenology and historical, those are types of qualitative research. And then across from here, you have the quantitative, which is uh, the descriptive when they talk about cohort studies. Uh, that is where this will fall. Now notice, literature review is up here. So when, and what is a literature review in general, someone? Okay, and that's the literature review, a collection of previous studies in a particular area that have already been done, okay? So, uh, Jenny, I want to make sure that you can use that information to corroborate what you're saying, but the literature review itself is a collective uh, report on a group, of, uh, a group of studies, a stack of studies. Uh, yes, you're exactly right. That's the, how, that's the what you do with mm -hmm. a literature review. It is not what is a literature review. You are exactly right. You, uh, literature review is a great place to find supportive evidence because it has, somebody has done a lot of the work for you in that area by telling you how those groups of articles fit together and are they going to support what you're trying to do or even give you some new pointers of things that you had not thought about looking at. So that's what the literature review is. And there are different ways to evaluate these types of studies. So I just want you to take note that literature review is not fitting with under quantitative research and it's not fitting under qualitative research. But literature review can be composed of all qualitative studies or all quantitative studies or a mixture of both. A literature review can do that but it is something separate than the other two. Okay, uh, so we're getting past our time here. Uh, we're going to just look at one more thing before we go, uh, looking at outcomes. And you will see, as uh, we look at outcomes, you will see uh, in your books, you need to look at the, uh, what is it? At the, figure that you can find on Brown uh, and all uh, on page, try page uh, 229, I'm sorry, 230, and that'll be 14.1, figure 14.1 on page 230. Everybody has that? We're looking at a couple of things. Notice that uh, we have been talking about uh, DNI, dissemination and implementation. And now we're talking about the outcomes for these things. And notice on in figure 14.1, you see all of the outcomes are in the second box here. And you see how they have separated dissemination outcomes from implementation outcomes. And so this tells you that I find it interesting 
that in your book, they have made a point to separate them, but notice in our figure, which is on the internet, they have combined them here, and they've given you samples of things that you can look at when you're looking at dissemination and implementation outcomes. So my question to you would be, how do you know which ones are best for dissemination and which ones are best for implementation outcome? Uh, it, it gets a bit confusing and it's not clear here. And notice in your book, they did not even bother to show it to you. Like yeah. that. Okay. And so uh, I'm going to say that uh, we'll look at a couple of last things here in your book. First of all, implementation outcomes have been more studied and well-established than dissemination outcomes. And as, uh, as Lindsay said, it's hard to say which percent is more developed uh, from looking at the chart. But here is an example in your book uh, at, uh, I think it's uh, Bronson page uh, 234. When you look at that chart, this gives you a better idea of where you can go with this. Do you see uh, the chart 14.1? As you look, these are things that you can think about when you're thinking about your project. Uh, they said here that you can use the dissemination and implementation outcomes for this left column, things that you might be looking at. But then you look at First of all, what level of analysis are you conducting your study? That's asking, who do I want to study? Where we were looking at the other chart. Are we looking at the organizational level? Are we looking at the individual level? Are we looking at the patient level? Looking at that, and that helps you to, de to decide which uh, theoretical framework you might want to use. So when you're writing your paper and they're asking you which framework you want to make a note, this is a place that you can go and see where your project fits in best and which theoretical framework has been used and might be able to help you. And are you looking at adoption, trying to adopt a new, in, a new uh, in, innovation? Are you trying to look at the acceptability using this? And the last thing I want to point out, and please make a note of this chart because it's going to... So I was just saying, make a note of this chart because it can be really helpful when you're doing your project as to helping you to decide what kind of framework you want to use for your project, for your outcomes, and as well as uh, giving you examples of ways to measure what you're looking at. That's the far right column. It's telling you... Things like, if I'm trying to adopt a set of clinical practice guidelines, uh, it might be good, and I want to see if the nurses are adopting this new set of clinical practice guidelines, I could use either the REAIM or ROGERS uh, <laughs> uh, theoretical framework for that. And then I come over here to the right side, far right, I can use surveys or observations or interviews it's helping me to start to set up my project and giving me ideas. And when you write your paper, you can quote Bronson and Kodich and Proctor as to why you chose to do it this way. Somebody talked about, I think, Jenny, I want to get credibility for my paper. This is a way to help you start getting credibility for what you're doing. And you can show your advisor, show your preceptor, show your reader, this is why I'm choosing to do this project this way. Does that make sense? So that, you're looking at that. And uh, I think the very, the very last thing that we will look at is on, uh, what is it? I think we were there, page 320. We're still in Bronson at page 320 and refer to your books for that. And when you look at this, this gives you the details of which 
of the steps that you want to make sure to cover based on which approach or theoretical framework you chose to use. If you decided for, uh, I think, re-aim, you want to make sure uh, this is, you can talk about, I can use this from the planning through the evaluation stage, it will serve me. And looking at all of the steps, which is the summary key features, and you may want to pull this Glasgow article mentioned in the right hand column and make that a part of your literature search, pull that, see what other types of articles they've read when you're talking about your methodology and why you're using, you chose to use ReAIM. So as I said, these are tools to help you start writing a strong paper, whether it be your next paper that you're turning in or your paper that you're going to be doing for your capstone, but these are tools that you'll be able to use. Any questions? So I'm going to stop there for tonight. And then that was where Dr. Clavel Hall uh, transitioned the lesson from focusing upon the uh, lecture that was being accompanied by the slides to going over some of the assignments that were specific to that particular semester. There was a brief mention in the slides to differentiate the idea of concepts, which you can see here in this slide, with the notion of constructs, which you can see here on this slide. And essentially the basic difference between them is that concepts can't be measured, whereas constructs can be measured. And as you're looking through those types of things, and as you're looking at those particular things beginning on page 237 of the Bronson et al. textbook, um, in the section that begins conceptual and methodological challenge, that's where the idea of the differences between concepts and constructs comes about. So beyond that, the only slide that was left in the slide deck was the summary slide. As you look to take away from this, one of the things that you want to make sure that you note is that you want to make sure that what you're doing has a level of rigor and then that rigor continues throughout the entire process. and there are a number of issues that you can have with measurement. Uh, the most common one that we see with young researchers, with beginning researchers, is the lack of a validated instrument, which um, essentially meaning that the tools that you are using to collect the data don't ha aren't psychometrically strong in nature. And the more that um, we can look at and engage the various stakeholders that have some sort of say within our evidence-based practice projects, the greater level of success that we will have in terms of being able to implement meaningful change within that context in which we are hoping to enact that change.